Well, so happy to see all of you. And uh, as I said, I came back uh, last night about 9 to 10 p.m. And uh, safe and sound. Uh, good to see my family. Good to see uh, all of you. And uh, again, we went uh, uh, as a group, uh, 27 people, 12 of them from uh, this church and uh, 15 of them from all over the place, Hong Kong, West Coast and East Coast. And uh, what a blessing to, to have all of us together for the past two weeks and uh, to, uh, to walk the land, actually. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. And uh, I have tons of pictures. And I want to uh, just uh, give me some time to reorganize them. And uh, uh, starting next, next Sunday, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll design a series and uh, introduce to you what happened there. But this is uh, one of the uh, favorite pictures uh, I had. Because we do have, we, this, this round, we do have a couple of uh, semi-professional photographers. And they did. Take some good pictures, and uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with my right hand, but in any case, uh, this is one of the places that we went to uh, in the past two weeks, and uh, it was an um, additional place because we found some time. So I talked to the driver, hey, can we just take some uh, off-track uh, places? And so, so we went. Um, so we were, uh, on that day, on this day, uh, we were going from Jerusalem, which is high on the mountain, and all the way to the east, to the Judean wilderness, all the way to the Dead Sea and Jericho and all that. Uh, remember that, right? The road from Jericho down to, uh, the road from Jer uh, Jer uh, Jerusalem down to uh, Jericho. And there is a road, right? And today is the Highway 1 in Israel. So we're, we're passing uh, different places, and I talked to the tour guy, and I talked to the driver. Hey, do we have time to go, go over there? And uh, we, turned a, we made a left turn. Uh, into this, uh, you know, off, off, off track uh, places. And the place was called uh, uh, Wadi Kilt. Q E L T. Uh, Wadi is in Arabic. It means some dry valley. Uh, usually it's just season, seasonal runoff. Uh, we'll go, go after the, uh, go, go into the, uh, the valley. But usually it's dry. And what you see on the left is actually the Wadi Kilt. And, um, uh, it's one of the uh, valleys coming out of uh, the mountain of Jerusalem all the way to uh, the Dead Sea Valley. Um, so it's kind of exotic place. Yeah, because uh, we were in this big bus, right? 27, almost 30 people. And then we would drive. Uh, I'm, I wasn't driving. I wanted to drive. But um, the, the driver was one of the just, just amazing drive, driver. And he drove the bus uh, on the cliff of uh, Wadiqiu. And we can see, you know, down the window, we can see the, the bottom of the, uh, the valley. And it's just amazing view there, right? Uh, on the left, lower left, uh, you see a monastery. The monastery is called St. George Monastery. And it's a, mon uh, it's a, a monastic uh, community that existed since AD 400. AD 400. So it has been around for 1,600 plus years. Uh, Generation after generation, there are Christians, Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians who uh, gather there and to, uh, to, uh, to, to live a contempl contemplative life and uh, keeping the tradition of uh, Christianity. So it's just amazing. And uh, this picture did not show up. Perhaps it did. Uh, we were standing uh, on, right on the top of the cliff and looking down to Wadi Kilt and St. George Monastery. And on the other side, of the, uh, the valley, we saw a uh, shepherd grazing the sheep on the, uh, on, on the cliff. And there were probably like hundreds of sheep and running up and down the cliff and, um, you know, uh, finding food, right? And um, this is actually uh, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Uh, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. And I have lacked nothing. And he leads me into uh, green pastures and quiet waters. And what do you think of when you read words like this in Psalm 23? Green pastures and uh, quiet waters. We, all, we, all, we, all, we always think of uh, the Scottish Highland, right? Where everything is green, right? This is actually Psalm 23. Green pastures. Can you see anything green in there? Maybe a little bit, right? Maybe a little bit. But that is the green pastures of Psalm 23. 
just enough for you, right? If you follow a wise shepherd, the wilderness is the place for grazing sheep. You don't graze a sheep in, uh, in your olive grove, right? In your wheat farm, right? Because those are for, for surplus, for, for humans, right? So animals, sheep and uh, uh, donkey and, and goats, they go out to the wilderness, which is just east of Jerusalem. Uh, often we read of uh, land of without water, land without water and uh, wilderness. This sort of picture is the wilderness. And if you think about Psalm 23, green pastures is the little green stuff underneath of the rocks. The little green stuff, you know, between the cracks. And sheep can go out and find them, right? And then they can get just enough, the essentials, uh, to be fed on. That is the theology of Psalm 23. You see quiet water? No, just seasonal runoff, right? As I said. But if you follow a wise shepherd, you get just enough water for you to live. Just enough for you to survive and even thrive in a land like this, right? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Um, so, you know, in, in order to understand some of the passages in the Bible, I think it, it's so essential for us to, uh, to walk the land. One of my professors uh, who passed away some years ago, Anson Rainey, he's a professional uh, biblical geographer. He always, uh, you know, when you take his classes, we always go out to the field, places like this. We don't sit in the classroom. We don't sit in an air conditioner, air conditioner uh, room to, to, to listen to a lecture. Most of the time, we walk out there. And sometimes we walk with him. And Rainey would say, you know, this is the only institute, only classroom, that we have a one-to-one -one map. Indeed, it was one-to-one, -one, right? Every step of the way is not the Bible map that we found on the, on, on, uh, in the Bible, but it's actually walking the land, right? So he's, he's, he, he, he always uh, emphasized one, one, one thing, is that we have to read the Bible with our feet on the ground. Our feet on the ground, right? Not in the ivory tower, but we the feet on the ground, right? So, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I, never, I, I haven't been to Wadi Kill for, for years. Uh, I've, I've led tours for, for the past over 10 years, and uh, usually because we want to hit different sites, different spots, and we want to go out there and, uh, uh, to, to see uh, as many places as we can. But it was such a unique opportunity. We can just pass through the wilderness and spend uh, extended time there. So there I was uh, actually reading Psalm 23. It's not the Scottish Highland, but God is always faithful, even in wilderness, right? Amen to that, right? Standing on the ground as we read the Bible, right? So, um, yeah, um, that's what, that's what, this is one of my passions, and I want to thank the church for letting me and letting their pastor to go away for a little bit and uh, to be a blessing to many other people. And uh, most of the people, uh, we, we, we go out to different sites, and they, the their first response has always been, wow, ah, yeah, I got it now, right? Yeah, you got it now, right? So walking uh, uh, with our feet on the ground as we read the Bible, right? So uh, perhaps next year you can go with me, right? Next year we'll go, okay? Next year, next year, next year, next year, okay? Okay, we can go anytime. I, I always tell people you can go, uh, you know, next week. As long as you got a passport and you got a visa card, that's all you need, right? Um, but uh, I did bring something back uh, this time. So uh, as a tour guy, I got some free gifts. So I got this uh, mineral hand cream from a Hava factory. Yeah, so all the way from Dead Sea, right? So uh, you, can, you can get a little bit uh, after the service, just like communion, you know? Yeah. <laughs> share, okay, share. Don't, 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 don't drink the bottle, all right? Don't drink the bottle, all right. Um, so it's good to be here, and uh, I want to reflect on uh, a, a short passage today. Um, and I want to tell you, we, in order to understand the message, the impact of the uh, passage, you have to understand the context. And that's why, this, that's why we have this theme of uh, walking the land. You need to understand the biblical background of Scripture in order to appreciate what Jesus has said. And this passage is um, Matthew chapter 8. 
Let's read that first. When Jesus saw the crowd around him, he taught them, the disciples, and he instructed the disciples to cross to the other side of the lake. And this lake is called Sea of Galilee, right? Or Lake of Galilee, Sea of Galilee. So they crossed to the other side away from the crowd, and one of the teachers of religious law said to Jesus, Teacher, Rabbi, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, Foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nets. But the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. And other of his disciples said, Lord, first let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, Follow me now. Let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Now, first of all, uh, this is a passage, one, one of the passages about discipleship, about the cause of following Jesus. Now, I'm, I must admit the very first time when I was much younger, uh, when I first read this passage, I was kind of uh, confused. This is actually one of the tough sayings of Jesus. Uh, one of the most difficult to understand sayings in the Bible. And what he said is that, uh, especially the latter part of it, uh, verse 20, verses 21 to 22. And another disciple said to Jesus, Yeah, I want to follow you. First, but first, but first, let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus said, Yeah, go ahead and bury your father and follow me. No, he didn't say that, right? He said, follow me now. Follow me now. Let the dead bury their own dead. Now that's what I call really confusing, right? It's really tough. What is going on? I just want to bury my father, right? How long, how long would that take? Maybe a day or two, right? Right, you think about modern uh, burial practices. Um, can we just do that, right? And then I follow you? Because by all means, in, in Jewish culture, burying one's father is one of the most honorable things for someone to do it, right? Especially for son, right? In that patriarchal culture, you have to honor your parents, right? By the way, that's one of the uh, Ten Commandments, right? To respect and to honor your parents. And what is going on here? And um, I think in order to appreciate the impact of what Jesus has said, you have to understand, again, it's the context, the background of the Bible. The Bible is not something, you know, out of the blue, like a heavenly book. Let's drop down on, from, from heaven to earth, and then we can read it. And the, and, and the message and the languages are magical. No, the Bible has its own context, right? In order to understand what the Bible says, we have to understand the background. And here we go. Uh, we have to understand in Jesus' time, uh, burial is a huge thing, just as today, right? No matter you like someone or you don't like someone, if you know him, and he passed away, you probably have to, you know, change your clothes, all black, and you go to the funeral home just to, you know, uh, pay the final respect, right? It's a huge thing, but in Jesus' time, it was a bigger, huge deal. Um, so in the Jewish culture, in uh, Jesus' time, they would do this uh, in their burial. So from left to right, when someone died, what to do with the body? What to do with the dead ones? First, um, because in the ancient days, they didn't have refrigerator and uh, uh, ways or, or, or technology to preserve uh, the body, and it gets stinky really quickly. That's why someone died, and then they have to bury the body almost ASAP, almost immediately. They have to put the body in the tomb and this is uh, the typical Jewish um, uh, ritual of uh, burying someone. So first of all, someone died all the way to the left. You're going to go into uh, the burial almost within 24 hours. And then you kick in a seven-day mourning period. It's called Shava. Uh, Shava means seven in Hebrew. So seven days they will mourn at home uh, almost privately. And then, after the seven days of Shiva, they were going to Shiloshim. Shilosh is three, Shiloshim is 30. Uh, 30 days of uh, mourning, and then some of the uh, members of the family and uh, extended relatives, they will come to your home and visit you, 
uh, bring you food or bring you gifts and all that stuff. And 30 days, 30 days. And then you wait for about a year. So you, 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 you put the body in the tomb. And then it will take time for the flesh to decay, right? To, to, to be all gone. And then almost one year later, you will return to the same tomb and to gather the bones, right? If I die, you bury me in, to, in, in a tomb, right? And then one year later, you come back and you don't see me anymore. You see my bones, right? And that's what they do. It's the second burial, second burial. And they put the bones into some stone boxes called ossuary. And these boxes you can still see all over uh, Jerusalem. And uh, this is one of the pictures of the first century tomb. And they call Kokim tomb. Now this is what, what, what I said uh, in the timeline. Once the body is there, once someone dies, and you have to prepare the body, and you bring the body into the uh, chamber of the tomb, okay? By the way, this tomb is right next to uh, uh, a, coffee, a coffee shop. Yeah, it's very nice. Yeah, you can have a coffee and a croissant and, uh, you know, right in front of the tomb. Interesting. <laughs> uh, it's, it's on a Mount Scopus in Jerusalem. Anyways, uh, you see the entrance of the tomb, right? Back, back in the days of Jesus, 2,000 years ago, um, the, the tomb is dated to the time of Jesus. Uh, it was covered. It was a cave, actually. So now it's open air. Anyways, it was covered uh, uh, 2,000 years ago, and the cave, the ceiling of the cave did, did not collapse. Um, so you go into the entrance. Can you see that? There are three side bench, right? And then you bring the dead body on the bench, and you put spices and, uh, you know, whatever you need to prepare the body for. And then you're going to prepare it well. And then you're going to stuff the body into, you know, see the small holes? Those are called coke, K-O-K-H. You stuff the body in there, and then uh, 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 one of the cooks, or one of the kukim, or kukim is plural, kok is uh, sing singular. So as you can see, there are a lot of uh, kukim, right? Because most of the tomb is family tomb, right? So my father used it, I use it, my son used it. My grandson will use it. So there are a lot of people being buried in the same place, in the same tomb, because they belong to the same family. So that, that, that's why they were, it's like a refrigerator. All right, you put the body in the uh, kukim, and then what do you do? What do you do? You go home for seven days of mourning, and then 30 days of mourning, and then? And then you wait, right, for one year. And the body stay in the tomb, in the kok or kukim, and then let the flesh decay. And when everything is gone, you go back one year later for the second burial, which is the ossuary, right? All you see one year later, you open the tomb again, go inside and uh, gather the bones into uh, boxes like this. Some of them are decorated uh, with some geometric design. Uh, some of them are bigger, some of them are, are, are smaller. And the length of the uh, stone box is the length of your longest bone. Where is your longest bone in your body? Right here. What we call it? Femur, Femur right? Femur, yeah. This, this one. So for me, I probably need a, 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 a bigger, bigger box. Um, anyways, um, it's just a matter of, uh, it's a business of recycling, right? Um, because they, they're doing a lot of uh, different stone work and stone building, especially Herod the Great. Uh, he built or expanded the, uh, the, the temple in Jerusalem so big. And that's why there were so many leftover stones, right? And they made uh, vessels out of the stones. And one of the, va the vessels is the ossuary. So they, they would go back one year later and gather all the bones and put them all in the uh, stone box. And then you put the box by the entrance or by the, uh, uh, just on the side of the uh, chamber. So the dead upon that will be uh, gathered in the tomb. And then the new dead will be buried in the same tomb. And then you go through the same cycle, thir uh, three days and uh, what, seven days and 30 days. And one year, you go back for a second burial, gathering the bones and uh, put in the um, stone boxes. So with that background, you can actually understand what happened, first of all, on Good Friday. All right, Good Friday. 
uh, Good Friday, when Jesus died, his body has to be burial, buried, right? For uh, immediately, right? And remember what time Jesus died on Friday? Before Shabbat, right? Before Shabbat. Once Shabbat kicks in, you cannot do any work. You have to wait for another 20, 24 hours, right, to continue to work. So that's what happened on uh, Good Friday. Jesus died, and quite un un unexpectedly, and the, uh, the, the women disciples, or the disciples, would uh, uh, put his body into one of these tombs, and the Bible says it's a new tomb, a new tomb for the, uh, for, for the, uh, 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 for the important people. Um, so he put the, they, they, put, they would put his body on the bench, and because Shabbat is coming, and they could not finish the work, right? They got to get out of the tomb because it's Shabbat, right? You got to purify yourself in order to uh, 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 prepare yourself for, for Sabbath of 24 hours. So they exit the tomb, and then when did they come back? After Shabbat, right? After 24 hours. And then on the first day of the week is the first day of the work. Um, so they return, the women return to the tomb, and they try to, probably they would ask someone to open the tomb again and come back and just finish off whatever they did, did not finish. It was kind, kind of in a hurry, so they didn't finish all the uh, ritual of uh, mourning and uh, burial. So that's what they were planning to do, returning to the tomb for the first burial. Put Jesus' body into what? One of the kukims, right? Stuff him, stuff him in, in into one of the holes, and uh, wait for another year and uh, come back for ossuary. That's what happened on Good Friday. With that picture, or with this timeline, uh, you would understand what. Oh, this is one of the diagrams. Uh, this is better, right? Uh, the entrance is in, uh, on top or at the middle of the picture. You remove that, you know, big stone. And you get into uh, the uh, the cave. You have the center chamber, and then you have Kokims. In any case, with this timeline, you can understand what Jesus said. He said what? First of all, the, the, and other disciples said to him, "Lord, first let me return home and bury my father." But Jesus replied, "Follow me now. Let the dead bury the dead." That's what happened here. Now, I want to ask you a question. With that background, I explain. This another disciple who came to Jesus and said, hey, uh, first let me return home and bury my father. Um, for this disciple, assuming his father just passed away, when did this, this disciple approach Jesus with that request? When? Is it before first, first burial? or before second burial. There's no way for this guy to have any room to come to Jesus and follow him and say, hey, first let me go back to and bury my father. There's no way that he can find time before the first, first burial. You understand what I'm saying? So it has to be this guy, when he approached Jesus, he already done his first burial. And he's waiting for another year. Right? Because the second burial has to be done. Right? So when this another disciple approach Jesus, it has to be between the first burial and second burial. So what he meant when he said to Jesus, first let me return home and bury my father, he was referring to the second burial, the ossuary. So he is asking Jesus, hey, can I can I want to follow you, but hey, dude, let me have some time. And let me get the ossuary done first, the second, second burial. So in, essentially, he was asking Jesus for a year time. I want to follow you, but next year, <laughs> because I'm going to get something done, right? The second burial. It's not done yet, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's no way his father just died, and then he, he would come and follow Jesus, right? This is the most dishonorable thing to do, right? His father died, indeed. It's pretty sad. But he has already done his first burial because first burial happened almost immediately, right? There's no time for this guy to approach and follow Jesus. And this another disciple actually is between the first and second burial and asking 
Jesus, hey, can I have some time before I follow you? Let me first go back home and bury the dead. Now, in rabbinical uh, tradition, for all the sons, especially the firstborn son, there are three rituals in their lives that are most important. Think about your life, your li- in your lifetime. Uh, what, what are the most important things that, that you could have done? You could have done, right? For the Jewish t- tradition, the first most important thing, most important ritual for all Jewish men, the first one is circumcision. It's done on the eighth days after, after uh, the child is born, right? So it's done. That's the most important ritual they have to go through. The second most important uh, moment in their life or ritual in their life is wedding. Get married. That is the biggest day. And the third one, actually according to ancient literature, Jewish literature, is the second burial. It's the ossuary. Because you will finish the duty, the honorable duty of, of the first sponsor. So it's not really the first burial that is important. The most important thing is wait for another year until you come back to the same tomb and gather the bones of your father into ossuaries. That is the most important ritual and most important social honors one has to gain. Now with this background, you understand the impact of the passage. Um, You understand what Jesus is trying to say. Because the entire Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, no one can claim the authority higher than your parents. Remember I said one of the uh, Ten Commandments is honor your father and your mother, right? Your parents, in this kind of culture, is the most important people on earth. You have to honor them. You have to pay respect to them, right? From the, entire, uh, from, from the first page of the Bible to the last page, nobody can claim the authority higher than your human parents, except God himself. Only God can step in and say, I have a higher authority. You honor me above all others, even your parents, even your grandparents. So as you can see, what Jesus is claiming it's actually the authority of divinity. He's not a normal guy. <laughs> he, has, uh, he has power and authority and honor much higher, infinitely higher than any human authorities, including your parents. Remember I said, uh, I quote this uh, line to you before. Uh, listen up. This line says, Either Christ is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. Right? A.B. Simpson, founder of Alliance Church. Christ is all of all, otherwise he is not Lord at all. So my point is, there are two basic points. Let me go back to the slide. From this passage, it's the priority of following Jesus. Following Jesus, honoring Him, worshiping Him, and serving Him is above all. Above your own emotional stuff you have to deal with, above your parental authorities, above everything else. And Jesus is the highest because He is God Himself. He is the Lord of everything. He is over everything of your life. It's the priority of following Jesus. And secondly, it's the timing of following Jesus. Um, I, I gave you the chart. I gave you the, uh, the timeline of a typical Jewish burial in Jesus' day. And um, I already explained how it is for this and other disciple to approach Jesus. It has to be between the f- after the first burial and before the second burial, the ossuary. So this and other disciple is asking Jesus, for a different timing of following him. He said, yes, I want to follow you, but let me delay for about another year 
and then I will decide to follow you, right? And Jesus said what? Let the dead bury the dead. What does it mean? With that tomb picture in your mind, you understand what Jesus said. Because inside a family tomb, there were so many dead people, right? In the past, your grandparents, the great-grandparents, the bones were there. The dead were with the dead in the tomb. And Jesus was saying, hey, you need to follow me. You have to follow me now. And also, if you understand uh, the story flow, the story plot of the Bible, the Gospel of Matthew specifically, we read uh, chapter 8. Um, chapter 8, Jesus already started his public ministry. And he was on his way to Jerusalem and died on the cross, crucified, die, be buried, and rise again. How much time does he have? How much time does Jesus have between the disciple approaching him to the time of Jerusalem, his death? Less than a year. Less than a year. As you can tell, this another disciple did have the intention to follow Jesus, but he did not understand the time is running out. If you don't follow Jesus now, you will never be able to follow him. You see what I'm saying? Because he will be gone. If you need, really need to follow this rabbi, if you really need to follow Christ, you got to do it now. Because according to the story of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus had less than a year on earth. There's no time for you to wait for another second burial to be done, anything to be done, any, any stuff that you have to do. It's such a reminder for us, if we follow Jesus, we better do it now. Because he claims the highest priority. And also, your time is running out. You have to follow him. Following Jesus is the biggest deal. There are many matters in our lives are big deals. But there's no bigger deal than following Christ. There's no one greater than Jesus himself in terms of authority. So Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, right? He's actually poking fun of uh, the complicated, you know, ritual, uh, burial ritual the Jewish had. Um, it's too complicated to follow. He's actually challenging us to lay aside anything that is stopping us from following Jesus today, at this moment, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year. Because who knows, right? Um, in our past two weeks, we, uh, we, we, we were with, I, w I was with uh, the 27 people uh, on the trip. And uh, I think on the, uh, by the end of first week, some of the members are from Hong Kong, uh, they received uh, really shocking news because one of their relatives uh, suddenly had a stroke. And she's a young mother. 30 some years old. Had a stroke, you know, on the street, didn't, didn't have any sign, and she had a stroke, a massive stroke. And she was uh, um, uh, uh, immediately hospitalized in ICU. 30 some years old. And we were praying for, for her uh, on our trip almost, almost every single day, all of us praying for her. And um, uh, I think she's still alive in, in, in ICU, but in a very critical condition. What I want to tell you is that if you want to follow Jesus, this is the time. Not wait for until, you know, something has been fixed, right? Not, not, not to wait like, okay, let, let the church be better and then I'll follow Jesus. Or let me, let me take care of my, you know, relational issues and uh, my work or my career and uh, even, you know, I won't follow Jesus until I retire. You know, if, if that is so, I don't think this Jesus is what I want. I don't think Jesus, this is the Lord of all. This is not the God worthy of my following. If I have to wait and he will become my footnote of my life. No, Jesus is the content of your life, not the footnote. We are the footnotes. So I want to remind you following Jesus is now, not tomorrow, not next year. Let's all pray together.
pray that we will return and repent from our delay, delaying our decision in ways that you can think of. You know, sometimes we have reservation of following Jesus because this or that, no matter what is this or what is that, Jesus has the highest authority and following him is now. Father, we come before you, we realize that your son, Jesus Christ, is the Lord of all. And I pray that at this moment, all the brothers and sisters in Christ, all the friends, we do have some stuff we have to deal with. And perhaps some of the issues in our lives, our career, our work, our study, almost anything we can think of can be the barrier, the barrier of following you right now. And I pray that you will listen to us, listen to our prayers. Help us see that you are the God worthy of our praise, worthy of our, our, our following you. I pray that at this moment, your spirit will cleanse us, lay aside all the issues, worries, and reluctance that will come and follow you right now. In Christ's name, pray. Amen.